So I, uh, I have never done a workshop like this, and it's actually, I just want to facilitate a con conversation. Um, you pro most people probably know how I lost my legs. It was not in Vietnam. It was because of Vietnam, but it wasn't in Vietnam. Uh, after I was in Vietnam, I got very radicalized and conscientized. And many years later, I was attempting to block a munitions train carrying munitions to El Salvador and Nicaragua at the Concord California Naval Weapons Station in Concord, California. And, uh, hmm? The kid on the tracks was you. Yeah. So uh, there were three veterans. We were starting a 40-day fast on the tracks. It was well publicized. The protocol was always to stop the train and have people arrested. It had been happening for 20 years at that location, except for that day. And uh, that day, the train accelerated to uh, over three times its speed limit of five miles an hour, 17 miles an hour. Uh, and the train crew was ordered not to stop, or was actually ordered to keep the train going. Under no circumstances was it to stop. And we had been vigiling there for uh, three months already, and there'd been a lot of arrests. Uh, so when the train came, we, the three of us were on the tracks. We had written a letter to the base commander told them exactly what we were going to do. We were going to fast for 40 days at that location. But we expected to be arrested, but we were hoping that the, tra that the base would uphold international law and no longer run trains that were killing innocent civilians in El Salvador and Nicaragua. Of course, we knew they were not probably going to stop running the trains, uh, but that they would arrest us. So at high noon on September 1st, 1987, the first train came that day. It was our first day of a 40-day fast, and I did not get off the tracks in time. Actually, it was inconceivable that the train was not going to, it was just not conceivable that the train was going to run through us. Um, so I went under. The other two guys just barely escaped, and I had uh, 19 major injuries, many broken bones, uh, lost the legs fractured skull, broken shoulders, broken elbows, broken ribs, uh, and somehow I survived. That was uh, 28 years ago. But that's not what the workshop's about. And I haven't worn long pants for at least 17 years because I discovered it was so much more comfortable walking without the drag of the cloth down my legs. For several years, I, I was disguising myself, trying to be normal um, by having long pants and not wanting to freak people out. Uh, but I've discovered it leads to lots of conversations, uh, especially with people who have recently lost a leg and they want to know what it's like. Mm -hmm. And does life go on? Um, so um, it leads to actually wonderful conversations. Um, now, when I was in Vietnam, I have to just say this before I get to my questions, I discovered something that was so shocking to me that uh, it's never left me. I was a night security commander of an air base in, in the Mekong Delta. I was the first lieutenant. And uh, we were basically securing the base from attacks. And I had another duty to uh, assess the success or failure of airstrikes. And it didn't occur to me that air targets of airstrikes were inhabited villages, undefended inhabited villages. And it turns out that in the, f the week that I was assigned to this assessment task, I went to five targets, and they were all inhabited, undefended fishing and farming villages, of which there were somewhere between 700 and 900 killed in those five target bombings. I didn't think it was conceivable that the United States would intentionally target uh, these villagers. So 
I had been drafted out of law school. So uh, I was in my uh, second year of law school when I wound up going in the military. And I was 27 years old when I was in Vietnam. So I was a little older. And somehow I had to get to the bottom of it. I wanted to get an explanation for these bombings because it seemed like they were beyond comprehension. So I spent a day at our intelligence office in Saigon going over 7th Air Force bombing reports of the areas where I had witnessed the bombings and discovered that all these bombings were considered successful killings of Viet Cong. Um, and I was meeting with our intelligence officers for several hours going over these reports. And they were telling me that they were mystified by their own intelligence, which had identified destruction of VC units, which were identified by letter and number, uh, like unit A7, um, that they'd all been destroyed in a bombing and an airstrike, but that that same unit was discovered a few days later in another location. And I said, well, now we know what the explanation is. They're simply bombing villages and calling them VC units. And they said, aha, that's right. And actually, about 10 years ago, one of those intelligence officers tracked me down to thank me for unraveling that mystery. So I had to go through suicidal ideation because I was recognizing that my own country was intentionally, deliberately murdering people. Now, in my subsequent years, I have studied the history of US policy, world history, and US history, and have discovered that the United States has invaded almost 600 times since 1798 in over 100 countries. And since 47, with the CIA, has covertly intervened thousands of times. So it's our pattern as a nation state. We were formed on the theft of indigenous land by the genocide against the Native Americans. We then stole the labor from the Africans to build our early agricultural base. And then in the 20th century, we went all over the world stealing resources from the rest of the world to build our exceptional civilization called the United States. But because of that Vietnam experience, I knew that probably behind civilization, all civilizations, is lots of unspeakable behavior. And because we have committed all our interventions with total impunity, we have no memory. We live with no memory. Certainly no visceral or vibrant memory that's alive. We say, OK, we know that the yeah, we did this to the Indians, that was terrible, but what are we going to do? Well, I think it's in our cultural DNA and that we have not recovered. And that the wool has not been pulled over our eyes, but the wool is our eyes. And that we have not been able to have the courage to face the, our origins that formed this, uh, what we call, American culture, it's really a US American culture. And I have had to deal with this inside myself for 46 years since I was in those villages. I know, I know that we're built on unspeakable genocides and suffering and misery all over the world and against the Mother Earth. So in my more recent studies of climate change, uh, and I'm pretty, and I've been kind of studying for solidly for, I mean, pretty consistently for the last year, reading as much as I can. Um, it's pretty clear now, and I'm just a lay person, so I, I, I was a lawyer and I dropped off from that 42 years ago. I couldn't even stand up for the judge. It was so, I was so maladjusted, maladjusted meaning I couldn't just automatically obey an authority figure anymore. I, I couldn't do that. 
I mean, I didn't have that worked out in my head. It was a visceral response to the bailiff saying, everybody rise in my first case, my very first case. And I said, oh, shit. <laughs> I forgot about the protocol. And I'm going to have to do this if I'm going to be a criminal lawyer. <laughs> I, I, I walked out and I never went back. But um, that was in, indicative of just how much I'd been affected, but I didn't even, couldn't even articulate it yet. It was just all at the visceral level. Um, so in looking at this climate data and looking at our history uh, and learning a lot from Native Americans, um, I have come to the realization that we're, we, all, all species have a lifespan, just as each one of us has a lifespan. The only thing that's unknown is the termination date, the date we actually pass into another world. Uh, and the same thing is true with species, including Homo sapiens. And our modern version is about 200,000 years old, although our origins go back much further than that. The Earth is 4 billion years old. The universe is 14 billion years old. And some kind of early uh, human was 7 million years, but modern man would be 200,000 years. And now the carbon has been built up from our modern lifestyles to the point where we've gone past 400 parts per million. And they said 350 was a threshold. And it seems now that the temperature rise is going to be, it's already an irreversible trend, which is not reversible in, in our time frame. And it seems like it's going to go to at least 4 degrees centigrade. Not two degrees, not three degrees, but four degrees. And we can't survive at four degrees, certainly not at five degrees. So um, we're facing what I would suggest is an evolutionary moment to face the consequences of being arrogant and not humble being separate from nature and not part of nature. And this is a 10,000 year cycle. When we domesticated plants and animals, we at that point kind of in an epistemological level, we became separate from nature. And that's fatal at some point, it's fatal because we are nature. And when we assault nature, we assault ourselves. And the Native Americans told us when we spit on the earth, we spit on ourselves. So. I'm going to pass out. I didn't, I didn't know if anybody would show up at this workshop. And I, I didn't know if I was going to show up for the workshop. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to pass these out. And not everybody will get one. But um, So I, uh, I have these three premises that I think are critical for us to deal with as human beings. The first premise is, these are what I call unthinkable premises. The US as a nation and culture is irredeemable and unreformable, and we don't really want to try to change it. That's one premise. You don't have to agree with it, it's a premise. Second premise is um, industrial civilization, now nearly 300 years old, is a heat engine that is destroying virtually all life on the planet its collapse is inevitable and essential. And the third unspeakable premise is the Gaia, our Earth life force, is in process of a massive correction of our species' wayward behavior, most noticed through warming, but other things too. And when you look at tipping points, um, you, you, you find there's certain moments where a certain small, a small change leads to a dramatic, huge consequence, such as a temperature rise to a certain level, then other things break down. And the most significant is ice. The ice 
storage in Antarctica and Ar in, in the Arctic. And the ice plays a huge role in maintaining our, our, um, our Earth in a way that we can inhabit it. Um, so I'm not an expert at any of this. Uh, my pursuit for 45 years is trying to understand the history of denial, the denial of myself, in myself, the denial in my own family that this only when I came back from Vietnam because I was trying to tell them that this was an unspeakable thing we were doing in Vietnam. And they were born again Christians and they were very active in their church and, and um, I'd grown up in the same church. I was president of my Baptist Youth Fellowship when I was a kid and I'd been a good athlete in school and a good student and I was their good boy. And when I came back from Vietnam, I said I didn't want their church or their state. That I had to start, I had to start on another path. Uh, so these, are, these questions, I have not had these, these notions for since I left Vietnam, but they've been kind of percolating in my brain for a long time. And more recently, um, it seems like we're on, the earth is on hospice, is in a hospice situation. And uh, I don't want to be in denial about it. And I don't want to pretend, because the whole society has been pretend since the 1600s. Pretend, pretend, pretend. Lie after lie after lie. We're built on lies. Uh, we've never been able to deal with original genocide uh, because it's, an, it's, so un, it's so painful to think about. And it's even painful for me to think about what I did in Vietnam. or what I was involved in. It's been 46 years. But it changed my life. It actually awa awakened me. It actually blew out my paradigm. And I was so comfortable before, I don't know whether my paradigm would have been blown out. I wasn't interested in changing my paradigm. I didn't even know it was a paradigm. It was just, I lived in the wonderful country of America. And then I discovered I had to figure out a way to survive in it, morally. And I feel like I'm still suffering from, or dealing with the moral injury to happen to my soul. I call it moral injury. Some people call it PTSD, but it's a moral injury. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that pierced the essence of being human. And then when I realized our whole nation was built on it, and probably all civilizations are built on this, I started thinking, now what does this mean for us as human beings? Maybe this now is an evolutionary moment to come to grips with what compassion is about. Compassion and learning to live in the moment. Forget about whether we're going to survive or not. It's how are we going to be authentic right now, right in this moment. Let the chips fall where they may. But it's like an evolutionary mandate to come to grips with, re with reality and all of its awesomeness. Life is awesome. It's sacred. We've been treating it as it's not sacred. We've been treating it as a commodity. So since I'm not an expert at doing workshops or this subject, um, and I've had to deal with a lot of traumas in my life, which has required quite a lot of therapy, actually. And I've done it all without drugs and alcohol, which is very unusual for a, uh, a Vietnam vet. Um, but I've had a lot of help, too, along the way. So I'm not interested in talking a whole lot. I would like to know, I'd like to stimulate a conversation um, and by the way, I did bring three of my books for those people who haven't seen my book, Blood on the Tracks. Uh, I have three left, actually. That's about all I do have left. Um, and so I want to, um, I'm no expert. I'm not saying I know much of anything. Uh, I do feel like these questions are real. And um, I think uh, when people are dying, if you've been around people who are dying, 
they often have go into another consciousness near the time of their death. And perhaps this is, on our evolutionary journey, this is a moment where we need to come to grips with something far more than we've ever come to grips with. And that may be a wonderful thing, even if it seems un it's uncomfortable and painful, but it may be a gift or an opportunity to become more real and more authentic. Because in the first world, we have not been real. We've been living on other people's misery for hundreds of years. And uh, so, and I, I'd like to be on this uh, collective journey with lots of people and sorting it out and having lots of potlucks and conversations and uh, practicing being in the present, being in the moment, being with the breath. Because um, that's all we have. We have formulas for success and plans for this and that, but really all we have is in the moment in, in our breath. So I would like somebody to challenge all this or... You suggested that it would be good for our mental health or for our spiritual uh, evolution to come to accept the fact that species come to an end just as individual lives come to an end. <coughs> And so, I don't, I'm not so sure about that because um, it is a paradox that you don't want to be like, mm, okay, that's, that's okay, you know, that, that, that can get my head around that and then my humanity will be extinct and, um, and then I'll just try to have as good of a life as I can while I'm here. Uh -huh. That's kind of what I'm worried about. Well, having, having as good a life as you can while you're here might be learning how to be in the moment. Because in the moment you're with the universe, it's a pretty awesome place to be on a regular basis. I'm only practicing it, and I'm only I'm only still uh, kind of a rookie, but it is amazing to practice. It's kind of a Buddhist concept, really. It's uh, nothing nothing really revolutionary, except in the West, uh, it's kind of new. Uh, but I I'm only tell I'm only suggesting things. I I don't have any answers. Uh, so. Yes. Well, I, I like your analysis. It's intense, but it makes sense to me. But I feel like instead of just uh, saying uh, we don't have much time, that there is some obligation to do the moral thing in spite of everything. I agree. And that um, we need, if we're going to become extinct, we need to go down trying not to become extinct. And so, that, so we have that. So for me, that, that's an obligation. Regardless of the outcome. I agree. Uh, I think that the, uh, we, might ha we might change our expectations. If we have expect see, ex having expectations is a problem. Um, that takes you kind of out of the moment. But if you assume you want to continue living, uh, of course, that's a natural thing. But do we want to continue living in empire? Uh, and so we have to, I think we have to get clear that we are living in a horrible, horrible empire. They probably, they're all horrible, I'm sure. But we're in this one. And so the question over here. Yeah, you know, Ron, I, uh, I feel your pain. I heard you 10 years ago, and your tongue had venom. <laughs> it was cutting. Um, now I hear the softness. Um, and I can't talk verbally. I'm talking about feeling and seeing your, your language. And I know that when I talk to vets, it's like I'm talking to a whole other person. It's not an American citizen. If somebody else who knows the pains of the streets, the jails, the drug addiction, it's like, so somehow you got a dose of it in two years or uh, uh, how many ever tours you did in Vietnam? And it's a quick blow where <clears throat> I feel the same pain. And I'm feeling more because of Father Biggs. My brother was a Vietnam era, another buddy was dying in Vietnam, era vet. Um, and all of a sudden, and, and with monks, we did uh, a walk and visited Mother AME Church 18 years ago. And, they, and uh, I remember Shaney Goodman and Cheney went to a black church. So 
this, it, again, it's visceral. I can't explain it. It's coming up again. But in this mourning, in this grief, I hear the same thing that the moment is cool, it's peaceful just to watch and look at this thing going on and we're destroying each other. And how do I pick the pieces up when everything falls apart? So I hear you very clearly. I can almost smell the blood of death of what's happening to our country. And my dad used to say, we're the greatest country son after World War II, and I believe it. But now I, I'd be probably flipping the grave if I told him what I saw. <laughs> So thank you, Brian. Thank you. Over here, uh, here and then there. <clears throat> Just two comments. Um, your comments impressed me because although they're a minority opinion, I think of, of a, a lot of Americans, it's an emergency, it's an emerging perspective on, on what we've done. But it's held historically a rather new reaction to war my experience, most participants in wars for most of our historical history, people weren't bothered by they killed a bunch of people who weren't in combat themselves, although we must say most war was between combatants, but killing civilians wasn't a problem. And I think that's a long emerging process. And to me, one of the reasons I hope is I think it's becoming not dominant, but strong enough so that it's impacting national policy. Uh, that doesn't mean it's going to save us, but I, every time I talk to a vet, and I'm not a vet, who realizes, as you do, that what you did not only dehumanized you, but in others, it encourages me that something's happening that's critical if we are to survive at all. The other thing I wanted to comment on is that my understanding of evolution is such that species beginning with al algae even dominated because they were a successful adaptation. But the moment they went beyond a certain domination and, and were extinguishing themselves because of their domination, there emerged from their midst a subset that in fact made an adaptation that allowed life to go on. Unfortunately, the nonsense used this evolutionary insight to justify, and, and as did Marxist Leninists, but uh, to me, it, the question is, if most of us will not survive, our children, our grandchildren aren't going to survive, what can we do to, to make possible the emergence of a, of a group of human beings that in fact will be able to live in a way that won't continue to destroy life and, and ourselves? And that's my question. I'm not assuming we're going to rub ourselves out, but I agree that most of us and our children and grandchildren probably won't make it, but that doesn't mean what we do won't be relevant to those that might survive. I think of that Native American t-shirt that says resistance, <coughs> fighting homeland security since 1492. This nation, I've arrived at a similar conclusion to you, that this nation is headed to the fall of Rome, the fall of the United States will be written at some time. We were formed in violence. We've been violent throughout. We've had wars. I can't, I, I, I'm sitting here trying to think how can we be on the same track because you've been a warrior and I was a draft dodger. I worked finally because I needed money for the uh, military buying bombs and bullets. And in the night, I was carrying a sign, no war. And I was able to do that for about, I worked for him for 21 years, for about 15 years I was continuing to do that. And then, then we bombed um, Iraq the second time. And from that time until I retired, I was clinically depressed. Sometimes I couldn't go to work. I had a shrimp sending me things, getting pills and all that stuff. And I spent six years of misery. And I couldn't really understand it until I retired. And a couple months later, I was at my sister's house and I said, the depressions are gone. And she said, they'll never come again. 
And I said, why? And because she said, you're serving two masters, and they have diametrically opposed objectives. I think this country is getting paid back now in the violence in the street, the murder of black citizens, and now crazy people who we should be taking care of for their mental health issues, they're bombing churches. They're killing people. And we're getting the same violence turned in our face. And still, we do nothing about it. How do we get together? <laughs> uh, incidentally, uh, on the paper, I do say that I'm distinguishing between unreformable and irredeemable state. And I say, but we, as human beings, are redeemable and reformable, but not as citizens of a nation state. We have to redefine, I mean, kind of re -under understand in a new way a social configuration um, which is more close maybe to a hunter-gatherer community. I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time with the Zapatistas in Chiapas because I happen to really like their revolutionary process. They're all Mayan Indians, and they, um, their revolution was in 1994, <clears throat> and they took back their land. And um, they live in 1,300 autonomous communities, all in, uh, communicating by runners. And uh, they, they celebrate the fact that they're now free and that they will never agree to be a slave again, uh, no matter what. And uh, they, they're living, they live very self-reliant. It's a self-reliant area of Chiapas, Mexico. And that's more like what I think of as an early Neolithic period or late hunter-gatherer, uh, a sustainable society because they don't need external inputs for their survival. All their needs come from themselves and the region around them. You had a question. More of a comment, actually. Okay. Building on that, um, I'm just reading your words here. Uh, your voice. So building, voice. building on your point, um, in a couple of weeks I'm going to be doing my 22nd year at Brighton Bush Hot Springs with teens. So I, I lead a sweat lounge as part of that. I'm a pipe carrier. And I'm on board with you 100%. I, too, research this. And um, I, know all the, I know all the facts. And so planting a garden this year was a brand, brand new experience for the, the challenge of being present to the beauty of the moment, each moment. And, and my definition of beauty, what I teach my teens is, the Native American teachings, be, and Waldorf school as well, is beauty is the suchness of anything. So you don't find beauty in just something that you judge to be more bright or more whatever. Beauty is, is whatever that is in the suchness of it. And so, um, you know, and that's an eye-opening thing to teach an 11-year-old boy. <laughs> so, so I'm really challenged because I'm planning a curriculum based on creation. And I'm, I know I have a heavy heart, but I also know that in the depth of my grief this spring, um, I, I, I embraced so much more beauty than I ever have before. And even in reading, and, and uh, my husband builds weather stations, and they're around the world. So if you want to know the temperature on the South Pole station today, he, he put that station in. And so I, you can't unring a bell. I just want to say, I, I know that the an anomalies, we're talking four degrees centigrade, but right now at the poles and, and, and surrounding Arctic areas, it's, it's, we're 26 degrees above normal right. currently. And we're in, in, in these, in around, you know, Alaska, and we're on fire, and, and there's droughts, and, and it's the, what we're losing, I guess just to put it out there in words, is what we're losing is we're losing this breath between the equator and the pole, this movement, and, and the thing that holds the jet stream in place, that, that sustains life. And that's the part of the heavy heart that I carried this winter learning about, and experiencing this chaos, and at the same time, going into my greenhouse and planting seeds and challenging. Um, and again, it's hospice, untrained hospice, so it's all coming together. And I'm, I'm exploring it. I don't have any answers yet either, but I'm walking it out in really profound, deep ways that, um, that surprise me every day. Uh, back here and then there and then there. there. 
the hospice metaphor appeals, at least for two reasons. The point is to mitigate pain. The point is to reduce the difficulty of, of embracing life, of sustaining life. But we don't want to go down without trying. And people leave hospice. Individuals who are dying, frequent, who are on hospice, frequently come out of hospice, hospice because that kind of attention, the mitigation of pain, the living fully, the being really present, getting attention, giving attention, reconnects them to life. And, it's, and, and indeed, our species will have an end. We're not denying it, whether it's through our own cause or something else in a million years. But I really like that metaphor if we concentrate on that kindness, the compassion, that how do we make sure we mitigate pain for all in our condition. Maybe we'll come back. Maybe not. Uh, Bert, you had a question. Do you believe compassion and love, empathy, and mutual respect apply to everybody? Should we try and apply it to everybody, including those people that do harsh, cruel things? Yes. Is that part of the way? And how is it for you, if your answer is in the positive way, dealing with your feelings towards the person that drove the train, the person that gave the orders, and all the experience that you felt? And I'll make it personal just for my side. From my trips to Iraq, I've had to deal with feelings of anger, grief, knowing the deaths of hundreds of thousands of children, and then knowing that the US military, the Pentagon, has a disinformation campaign to deny any of those deaths. But that's me personally. I want to go back to you and ask you, how did you deal with the feelings and the experience that you had when your legs got cut off? Well, first of all, I have to tell you that I had no memory of the event. I um, suffered a severe f skull fracture and actually lost my right frontal lobe, which was destroyed in the, when I got hit by the train. And I don't, know, I don't have any memory, so I just know when I was in the hospital, they were trying to describe to me all the damages that had done, been done to me through this horrendous e event. So I don't have memory of it, but I certainly remember having to deal with the fact that I was lying in bed in the hospital, being told I didn't have my legs when I had phantom pain in my feet. And I thought, no, I have my feet. I, they actually, they were sticking up at the end of the bed, but they weren't, my, they weren't really my feet. They were uh, right away they had put on a cast, pylons, and a, and a phony foot phony foot, uh, because they wanted me to begin walking as soon as possible just to the bathroom. So that would stop, re uh, reduce the atrophy in, in the muscles in my thighs. But I didn't know that for a few days. I was lying in bed all wrapped up. Uh, all, all, my whole body was practically wrapped. And they were telling me I didn't have my legs. I said, I have my legs. I can see my feet sticking up at the, sh uh, at the end of the bed. And I have phantom pain, which they were treating with morphine. It's like, I don't have legs, and I have all this pain. And, um, but I think what, in a way, grounded me was I was doing exactly what I told them I was going to do, and why. Uh, I sent a detailed letter to the base commander 14 or 12 days in advance explaining when we were going to start this 40-day fast on the tracks, why we were doing it, just citing international law and saying under Nuremberg we had an obligation to interrupt the criminal behavior of our government by stopping the flow of these munitions which were all going to Salvador and Nicaragua, designed to kill innocent people. Um, Later, of course, I was in the hospital 29 days, and I got very good treatment. Um, 
the question was emerged later was how was I going to how was I going to deal with feelings about the train crew three train crew members the engineer well first the train crew the engineer and the two spotters on the front of the train whose job was to make sure the tracks were clear that was their job um, they were all Vietnam vets still following orders and they were now civilians working for the Navy. This was a Navy base. And then a few months later, the, they sued me for causing them mental disorder for not getting out of the way. This was, a, this was, a, this was filed in federal court in San Francisco. Um, I was served where I was, I was living at David Hartso's house. You know David Hartso. I was living at his house at the time, and I was served with the papers, which was kind of like surprising. Like, oh, they're suing me. Um, and then I wound up filing a suit against them and the Navy because no jurisdiction was going to file a criminal complaint against the train crew or their superiors. Um, so we had to go into federal civil court, a civil case. But when I was in three years of pretrial preparations, that included eight, uh, 40 hours of depositions, which is part of the pretrial process. And I'm sitting in the room with the three train crew members and their lawyers, and me with my lawyer. This is standard depositional procedure. They get a chance to depose me, I get a chance to depose them. We tried. Um, actually, the Navy did a report within six weeks of the assault, and the report condemned the commander, the train crew, and two levels of superiors between the commander and the train crew, and, and recommended that they uh, be severely punished with so many months of suspension. Uh, the Navy squashed that report, but we have it. We had a copy of the original report, which I still have. It's quite a good report. Um, so when we were having in the, in the depositions, those 40 hours, we get one five-minute break every hour to go to the bathroom. There's only one bathroom. It's very near the deposition room, and usually. All four of us went to the bathroom at the same time. <laughs> and so, since they were Vietnam veterans, and I was a Vietnam veteran, uh, and we would be all urinating in these <laughs> urinals, <laughs> looking at one another. <laughs> and um, I asked them at one point if they had been part of the Agent Orange lawsuit, of which I had been part of, just as a, an attempt to get a conversation going. And um, one of the, there was one black and two white of, of, the, of the crew. And the black guy said, I wish I had been part of that lawsuit. And there was a settlement which was very ba a bad settlement for the veterans, uh, which had happened in 1984, for which I had been at the trial in Brooklyn. Um, and that's as far as the conversation went. And when we're in the deposition room, across the table from each other, we're literally within four feet of each other. And I had to just practice breathing on my breath, basically. And at the end of the first day, uh, my partner at the time, Holly Round, who helped save my life on the tracks, she said to the U.S. prosecutor who was conducting the deposition, uh, well, he said at the end of that eight hours, we're sitting under a picture of, of uh, Reagan and Bush. This is a federal building, so it's the president and the vice president. They're in all the rooms. And he said, I think in an effort to establish rapport, he said, boy, it was really hard spending eight hours looking at those two guys above you, as if he was a Democrat and didn't like these. And Holly said to him, 
immediately and come back. She said, well, what do you think it was like for me to sit across the table from three men who tried to murder my partner? Whoa. <laughs> that was no thought for it. No, no, that was not premeditated. That just came out. And I thought that was a pretty good uh, response. But um, I did not have any uh, serious um, psychological issues for about five years. Partly because I was doing exactly what I said I was going to do. And, and, and oh, by the way, we found out in, in depositions that the train crew had been ordered not to stop. Uh, then, indeed, the FBI report of the one video footage that was there to document my arrest, which got this amazing footage of this one guy in the, in the world history who survived being run over by a train all on camera. Um, they said, yeah, the, the train was moving at seven, almost 17 miles an hour at the point of impact, which is more than three times the legal speed limit at that point, that location. And while I was in the uh, hospital, there was an FBI agent in Peoria, Illinois, Jack Ryan, who was fired after 22 years as an FBI agent for what? For refusing to investigate me and three other veterans as domestic terrorist suspects from a year before, 86. This happened in 87. So I was a terrorist suspect. And the train had never violated protocol at that location. They always had lots of police there to make arrests, but not that day. Uh, so it turns out it's you can kind of construct the scenario as an intentional murder or certainly an attempted, certainly a, um, an attempt of an assault with intent to commit harm. Uh, but we couldn't get any jurisdiction to bring criminal tri tri charges. Our, we could file the charges, but nobody would accept them. The county, the state, or the feds, and we tried all three levels. Yeah. But here you are as a human being, and you wrote in your document for us that compassion and love and kindness are crucial they are. for where we are. My question was, personally, how does that apply, how did that apply in your life vis-a-vis -vis the people that were responsible for this? I felt sorry for the train crew, for sure, yeah. okay. because they were following orders. And they hadn't learned to, this idea that you didn't have to follow authority, you didn't have to obey authority. Um, I never got. A, I did attempt to meet with the commander again at, when I got out of the hospital, and he, of course, refused. And in fact, he was replaced soon with another commander. Uh, probably his career was pretty much over by that time. But um, I have never really felt bitter towards any of the authorities. Uh, well, I don't know. I, I mean, I felt compassion for the train crew, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I felt we were peers. Um, and I never met the two intermediaries between the commander and the train crew. I know their names. And I never met the commander, but I'd see him in the distance. And I never remember, though, feeling or harboring any bitterness. Now, whether I had compassion, I'm not sure at the time. Now, I have developed a lot of compassion over the years about a lot of things as a necessity to survive. Uh, my nervous system, my spirit, my soul requires this honoring this connection with everything. And I didn't say in my opening remarks that the real revolutionary experience I had in Vietnam was looking in into the eyes of a Vietnamese woman who was lying at my feet. I remember that story. And her eyes were open because the eyelids had been burned off by the napalm. But I was in shock myself, but I was looking. I couldn't walk any further because she was at my feet, was holding three children. There were dozens of bodies everywhere. And I was looking at her. I was struck by seeing her open eyes. I was 
almost intoxicated, looking her eyes. And that's, at that point, I knew that she and I were the same. We were one. She was like my sister, if you will, or my family. I have never recovered from that. Or I, have, I mean, that's irre, irreversible knowledge. And in a way, it was a principle about the universe. Uh, everything's connected, including me with everything else. Now, that doesn't mean I've always had compassion, which is what I do believe is an imperative. It's an imperative to survive, uh, no matter what's happening. Um, but that experience was such an epiphany. I didn't want it. I mean, I wasn't even looking for it. I, I was hoping it wasn't a lasting experience because I was a very successful guy, and I didn't want to lose that, and I knew it was gone. You know, that's, it's an advantage, but I mean, at the time, it was really painful, and I was suicidal. I was suicidal in Vietnam for a couple of three weeks, uh, trying to deal with this. Um, and shortly thereafter, shortly after I had been in those five villages, I read an article in Stars and Stripes. This is getting away from your question, but I read an article in Stars and Stripes, which is a, a, a newspaper for military people, about a guy in the States that had been jailed for burning the flag, the U.S. flag, which, by the way, I can't stand to see it, and I know it's on the flagpole down here. Um, I think the most violent symbol on the planet to me. But... Um, um, and I was, sitting on, I was sitting on my bunk with my head in my hands thinking, the pilots on this very base I was at, protecting their planes, because I was the night security commander, they all got rewards for, for burning those people with napalm. And there's this young guy in the States who's in jail for burning the symbol for that policy of burning human beings. And that was a mind for me. It's like, oh my God, how, how do you grasp with this incredible diabolical contradiction of you punish somebody for burning a symbol of imperialism while we're rewarding the people who are bombing people under imperialism. So that was a moment at which um, I wasn't sure I was going to survive because <laughs> it was, but um, so in a way that experience prepared me for a lot of uh, painful ahas. And uh, so in some way, maybe my mother's love <laughs> gave me a grounding that enabled me to be res more resilient. I have no idea, but I've done it all without drugs and alcohol, which is kind of amazing. Um, not that I even intended to do without drugs and alcohol, but I guess that experience was such an incredible experience. I wasn't seeking uh, any big distractions from some deep awake, awaiting that gave me a sense of authenticity that I hadn't had before, like, wow. But it is hard to deal with the lie, and so I had therapists constantly that were in my life, even in the, even in the early 90s. I, the, the assault happened in 87, but I started going to therapy in 91, and Jung, a Jungian therapist. Let me make two comments. One is, um, you know, life is far more divinely awesome uh, than we know, because by the fact that I was drafted out of graduate school, which I didn't particularly want to be drafted out of graduate school, but I was for the war, you have to understand. I wasn't opposed to the war at the time. But I was sailing along in graduate school, kind of, I didn't particularly want to be a soldier. But, but because of my experiences in Vietnam, I really had an awakening. And I don't know whether I would have had that awakening if I hadn't been there. So. I'm just saying, it's, I don't even know how to explain that. Uh, it's just that life is an awesome journey. And uh, so I just want you to know that because I went to Vietnam, I really did get it. And I, and I was really a comfortable white male in graduate school. And I w didn't want that notion to be disrupted. 
And so I think the divinity had another plan. I was going to be disrupted. And I needed to have something that shook me. The other thing about Obama and adopting a, a law, see, the, we're a lawless society. It doesn't really matter what the laws are. The, we got to get beyond the law. We got to get to a deeper place as human beings. And what is our, how are we going to uh, collectively live without this authority from above? I mean, these laws, I left the law knowing it was lawless. And I was just going to be perpetuating a unjust society with the law. Uh, bombing Japan was legal. It was not un uh, unlawful to bomb Japan, as immoral and unspeakable as it was. So it doesn't matter what Obama would do or say or what laws are passed. Those laws don't have much impact around the world when it comes to maintaining U.S hegemony over geostrategic resources. We're going to do what we need to do to maintain our civilization, which all of us are complicit in maintaining simply by driving to this conference, of which I was one. Um, so it's, it's, quite, it's quite more complicated. But we, if we are all part of the problem, and we are all part of the kind of the new consciousness Un unfolding. It's, it's like, it's like we, I think this is an evolutionary moment for us to grasp that we've been full of bullshit and now it's time to get real with compassion and love and empathy and learn how to be in the moment and practice it and forget about formulas for success or plans to do this. We have to really, be, it's an urgent moment to be, discover the awe of life that's not distracted by materialism and, and plans to do this or that. And I don't have the answers. I don't know where it goes. But these kind of conversations, I think, are helpful. <laughs>